where it did not have much soil. And it sprang up quickly, since it had no depth of soil. There are those of you who receive the word with joy. You jump up and you run out and you're excited and you share the word. And then something happens. Something happens that stops you from being excited about Jesus, excited about the word. And you start to fall away. You start to let those rocks weigh on you. Peter, James, and John are like the rocky soil. They have so much joy and enthusiasm. They set out with Jesus on the journey. And yet, the waters become trouble. They begin to wonder about this stuff that he's teaching. They begin to lose faith and are troubled. And when Jesus is arrested, they run away. They deny him. They lose their courage. Listen, a sower went out to sow some seed. No matter who you are, no matter where you are on your journey, no matter you, whether you are in the thorns or the rocks or the good soil, you are welcome here. Amen. The first part of our scripture comes from chapter 4. Listen. A sower went out to sow, other seed fell on rocky ground where it did not have much soil. And it sprang up quickly since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. And he said, Let anyone with ears to hear listen. And these are the ones sown on the rocky ground. When they hear the word, they immediately receive it with joy, but they have no root, and endure only for a while. Then, when trouble and persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. When they had sung the hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives, and Jesus said to them, You will all become deserters, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, even though all become deserters, I will not. Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you, this day, this very night, before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he said vehemently, Even though I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all of them said the same. While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. When she saw Peter warming himself, she stared at him and said, you were also with Jesus, the man from Nazareth. But he denied it, saying, I do not know or understand what you're talking about. Then he went out into the forecourt. Then the cock crowed. And the servant girl, on seeing him, began to say to the bystanders, This man is one of them. But again he denied it. Then, after a little while, the bystanders again said to Peter, Certainly you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. But he began to curse, and he swore an oath, I do not know this man you are talking about. At that moment, the cock crowed for a second time. Then Peter remembered that Jesus had said to him, Before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down and wept.
and he broke down and wept. How did he get there? How did he get to that point where at the end of the Gospel of Mark, the last words written about Peter are, and he broke down and wept. So let me tell you a little bit about Peter's journey, his story. We saw a part of it at the beginning of the Epiphany season. Jesus was walking by the seashore and he saw some fishermen and invited them to come on the journey with him. And Peter immediately, that's the word used, immediately left everything behind and joined Jesus on the journey, immediately. With great enthusiasm, with joy, he sprung up and grew. But the very next day, the very next day, Jesus has been healing and teaching and preaching and is exhausted, and yet he wakes up before the first light and goes out to seek the Lord, to pray and be with God. And it says Peter was troubled and searching for him. And Peter went out and found Jesus and said to him, they are searching for you, they need you. It doesn't say anybody else is searching for him. It says Peter was searching for him. And the they is that amorphous group of people needing Jesus to do something and be something. And Jesus tells Peter, I have another call on my heart. I've been told to go around Galilee, to go around and share this word that I have. And Peter continues with him, journeying with him. The next notice we have of Peter is the appointment of the 12 disciples, where they are charged by Jesus to be sent out to proclaim the message and to have authority to cast out demons. And we will learn later on about that in one of the healing stories where it turns out the disciples who had been charged and given the authority to cast out demons are unable to do so and they ask why they couldn't do it. Because the story of Peter, which we like to think of as the crowning example of Christianity, right? Because you are the one on which I will build the church. You are the rock. In the Gospel of Mark, the disciples' journey is trouble. They have great moments of getting it right, and then moments of utter getting it wrong. So the next time we see Jesus with Peter, he takes Peter and James and John with him to heal the child of the one of the leaders of the synagogue. So we know that Peter is one of the special disciples, one of the important ones, one of the ones that have activity, right? Not one of the other 12 that aren't named. The next encounter with people happens in chapter seven and eight. In chapter seven, we learned about it last week where the scribes come and demand that the disciples follow the rules of the elder and the traditions of authority. And yet, Jesus says to them, it doesn't matter if you follow the particular rules. I'm not here about the little rules. I want you to think about what you're doing with your actions in your life. I want you to be different and better. 
And so Jesus defends the disciples, and they set out on a teaching journey that takes them into foreign lands, into the Decapolis, where they're going to visit all ten cities, where he starts healing people, and the crowds gather around all those foreigners, all those strangers, all those unwanted, unwelcomed folk gather around. And Jesus sees that they're hungry. And so like he had done on the other side of the lake with the Jewish people, with the foreigners and strangers, he too gathers them around and feeds them. And as the feeding is over and he's sending everybody home, they get in the boat and the disciples start arguing over what they will eat. They start arguing over what they will eat. And Jesus gives them that look, you know, the mom look. Really? 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 Um, but then they have a discussion. Jesus wants to know, who do people say I am? And they give him all the answers. And Jesus turns to them and says, who do you say I am? And that's when Peter gets his dramatic moment, right? Because you all know what he says now, right? You are the Messiah. And it looks good for Peter, right? Maybe he messed up with the whole wanting dinner thing, but he's got it now. He knows who Jesus is. And one sentence later, Jesus starts talking about what that means and all the troubles that are to come and the persecutions and the executions and the death. And Peter pulls him aside because, you know, if you're a good church member and the pastor has got a little out of control, you take them aside and rebuke them. So Peter took Jesus aside and rebuked him. Those are the words that uses. He rebuked him. And Jesus says to him, Get behind me, evil one. That is not my just mission. Now in all of this, Jesus doesn't reject Peter. He keeps bringing him along, keeps trying to show him what can be, what will be, what is possible. Because the very next scene, is Jesus taking Peter and James and John up on the mountain where Jesus is transfigured, meaning that not only does he experience God, but they see him and the Holy Spirit within Jesus as a glowing light. Like they see that Jesus is truly holy. And Peter says, because the text says he didn't know what to do. We should build tents for everybody here on the mountaintop. One for Elijah, one for Isaiah. We should build tents to remember this event. And then the voice, the Holy One says what Peter should have been hearing all along. Listen to him. Listen to Jesus. Listen to my beloved. Because part of what the journey of Peter teaches us is that he doesn't listen. That he hears but doesn't understand. That he, his body is present, but his mind doesn't always get it. And so when they, we get to Jerusalem, Jesus has a whole sermon called the mini apocalypse where he describes what will happen to people, how by following God, by following this teaching of Jesus, that it's going to lead to turmoil and trouble. And Peter and the disciples 
are charged by Jesus to say and said, and he tells them. There are going to be people who tell you that they have the word, that the Holy One is speaking to them, that they know what it is. Don't be led astray. And then we get to the day in our scripture reading today. The disciples and Jesus have shared one last meal together in which Jesus shared with them communion for the first time, breaking the bread and sharing the wine. And then he says he needs to pray, right? Oh, missed a point. After the meal is over, he says, and some of you will betray me, and some of you will deny me, and some of you will run away. And Peter very loudly and strongly says, I won't do that. And then when Jesus repeats, every one of you will run away. Peter again says, even if I was to die, I would not do that. They head out then to pray. And Jesus again takes Peter, James, and John with him up the mountain to pray. And he asked them to stay awake, to be a present for me, to be with me as I am troubled within my spirit. And he goes off a little farther to pray and the disciples fall asleep. He comes back, wakes them up and says, can't you stay awake? Can't you be with me in this moment of crisis that I'm having? Because I know that the authorities, the police are drawing near. Stay awake. And he goes on again and prays, and the disciples again fall asleep. He comes back, wakes them up, and says, please stay awake. Stay with me. Stay in this moment. Stay while I am troubled in my soul. And he goes on to pray. The disciples fall asleep. This time when he wakes them up, he tells them, this is the moment. It's now. And that's when Jesus is arrested. And Peter follows behind, but when he is noticed by a servant girl, and that servant girl says, aren't you one of them? He says, no, no. But then she calls the crowd and says, I'm sure that's one of the Galileans. And he says, no, no, no. And a third time he denies Jesus. And that's when we get to the words. And he broke down and wept. Now in Mark's gospel, that's the end of Peter's story. That isn't the end that you know, right? But in Mark's gospel, that is the end of Peter's story. He broke down and wept. An angel in the tomb will invite the married and the other women to go find Peter and to take him to Galilee. But our last words of Peter in the Gospel of Mark are, and he broke down and wept. Those words struck with me because I think it's been a place that we've all been this year, right? There have been moments because this is the week where we all went into our houses and didn't come back out. And we have only gradually come back out. And during that time, how many of us have broken down and wept? How many of us have struggled through what has been happening in our world, in our country, with our neighbors and friends? How many of us have broken down and wept because it's just been too much? It's just been too hard. That's why I chose these pictures this week. 
So, interested in love, the farthest one over is the first one, and it was done a year before the middle drawing. And it was based on an image that he had seen in the museums in London. Van Gogh had seen this image of a sorrowing man. And he used to go to the hay where there was a homeless shelter, and he would pay those who went to get aid there to sit for him so that he could draw them and paint them. And so the first attempt, you can see it looks very, very Dutch, like he's in the Netherlands, right? You got the shoes, the hat, the clothes that he's wearing. But that image kept sticking with him. And so a year later, he sets out to draw it again. But he wants it to be more universal, right now? Now the middle image you see is of an old man with his hands, his head buried in his hands. And when you see that, what do you say? See, what do you see when you look at that image? Both the first two are called worn out. And then we wait. He doesn't make the actual painting for almost 10 years. And in the painting, he takes that middle image and he talks about it differently. He talks about it, now it has different names. It's no longer called Worn Out. It's called The Sorrowing Man or At the Gate of Eternity. So sometimes when artists make things, they have an image in their head of what they think it says. And so the image in Van Gogh's head, or what he wanted this painting to say, was that man there at the end of his life is thinking about the life to come, that it isn't the end, that the sorrow isn't the final say. But when we look at that, we don't see at eternity's gate, right? Or at least I see the sorrowing man. I see a man who's had a life that is hard, right? And for whatever happened that week, he is stuck in that pain, in that sorrow. He hasn't moved from that spot, and, and you wonder about him, right? What was his life like that led him to that moment to break down and weep? sitting there by the fire. What we know about this parable is that Mark teaches us that characters have these traits, that they may fall away and fall from what had set out to be an important faith journey and experience. They may fall back. But that isn't the end of the story. And while Mark doesn't tell Peter's next part of the story, except to say that there's a place where you can experience the next part, we know and hear that next part. That that broken down and weaving Peter isn't the end. That the choice of your soil doesn't have to be the end. And I think about it this way. I want to leave you with a spot that I used to go and sit. When I was living in Connecticut, there is this falls that was real near one of my best friend's house and the apartment that Reid and I shared. And when I had a chance, I would go and sit there and pray because you could sit right up against the fall and the waterfall would you could listen to it, and it was really loud, and there was a pool with the fish. But across the way from where I sat, on the other side of the creek in the river, there was a rock shelf, okay? So it was layered rock all the way up and down. And at the top of that layered rock, there was a bit of an indent, like it would have been good for like a bird nest or something, right? One day when I was there and I was praying, I noticed a white flower blooming on that rock.
No soil. Like I said, it's a rock shell. Like if there was any soil at all, it was minimal. And yet that flower bloomed. That we may be broken down and weeping, but it isn't and doesn't have to be the last word. It doesn't have to be the thing that stops us. That rocky moment in our life can have a white flower that blooms on the top of it. That rocky moment can lead to us maybe experiencing at eternity's gate. Meaning maybe experiencing the Holy One of God present and with us and knowing that this is not the end, this is not all there is, that there is more. Listen, a sower went out to sow, and other seed fell upon the rocky ground. Amen. And he broke them and wept. This year has been a year of tears. There are so many times, there are so many people that have led to our tears falling. And he broke them and wept. For the things we didn't do, for the actions we didn't take, for the mistakes we made. And he broke them and wept. We weep for the lies, 500,000 deaths related to coronavirus. Be by the side of everyone mourning. Be by the side of those in the hospital dying alone. Be by the side of the weary caregivers and healthcare workers. And he broke them and wept. Be by the side of people in nursing homes who have been living in isolation. Be by the side of schools trying to find safe ways to teach children. Be by the sides of laboratories where scientists learn more about the virus and its variants. And he broke down and wept. Be by the sides of those who are afraid to leave their home. Be by the side of those who have no place to call home. Be by the side of people who cannot escape abuse and violence in their homes. And he broke down and wept. Be by the side of the children and families being held in detention centers. Be by the side of furlough workers. Be by the side of governments where politicians set the course of our future. Be by the side of all the places where hate, violence, and trauma grip human hearts. And he broke down and wept. For our families and friends who are ill, facing surgery, recovering from a fall. For our families and friends and the worries and struggles they encounter. For our families who are experiencing the brand new birth of a great, great grandbaby. We stop and pray. We stop and pray the prayer that you taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, 
and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now creation, sometimes we we wait lovingly for you, God. For you created the heavens and the earth and all that is in them. You cast sunbeams and open flowers and feed insects. You are beyond the galaxies and under the oceans and inside each grain of wheat. You can sustain all of your creation. Though humanity sometimes weeps, we wait lovingly for you, God. For you smiled on an outcasted hater, blessing her descendants. You guided the doubtful Israelites, leading them to freedom. You spoke through the judges and the prophets, providing words of wisdom. You lived among us as a teacher, a healer, and friend, giving us a sacred path to follow. You could have made us self-sustaining, but you did not. Your love sustains us. In Jesus' love incarnate, you provided us all we need for each day. His words comfort the weary. His actions challenge the contented. His touch heals the sick. His presence feeds the death's deepest hunger in our souls. In Jesus and in his feast, you provide for us the sustenance we need to respond to the cries of creation. The bread of life nourishes our deprived bodies. The cup of blessing revives our thirsting souls. The gathered community strengthens our growing faith. Through the church sometimes weeps. We, make, we wait lovingly for you, God. For centuries, Christians of different customs have gathered to commune with you and each other through the sharing of the feast. In their partaking, you have been with them just as you are with us now. And so we join with our siblings around the world by remembering that night, the night where Jesus was denied and betrayed. He took bread, he blessed it, and he broke it, and shared it with his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for remembrance of me. After supper, Jesus took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to all for, to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant of my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us pray. God, we remember and give thanks for your Son, and we ask that you bless and pour your Spirit upon these simple things of bread and wine. Make this broken bread whole in our taking. Make this full cup overflowing in our sharing. With these elements, nurture and sustain us. Amen. The bread of heaven broken for you. love poured out for you. Take and drink. Let us pray. God, may this bread and this wine be signs of your love for us. And as we leave here, may we be fed by your love, so that we may feed others. Amen.
nobody told you today that I love you, remember that God loves you and always will. That Jesus loves you and always will. That I love you and always will. May you listen. May the sower work on your rocky soils, on those places where you are broken down and wept. May God's love surround you. And may you so love. Amen. Thank mm -hmm. you.